small group tonight, but that's okay. Um, it's not about how many people, it's the right people. <laughs> um, my name is Caitlin, and I'm with PTAP, and we are a subcommittee of the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association, and that's how I got to know Orin was through PTAP. Um, we host a monthly Native Prairie Speaker Series. We try to make our way around to small communities in rural Saskatchewan, and um, it's nice to be close to home. <laughs> um, we also do online speaker series. So we have a webinar, and you can sign up um, to watch it um, from your computer from wherever you're located, and we have, cover a variety of topics. Um, and they're always free, so you can watch any time. And we also put the recordings on YouTube, so you can always, if you're ever bored or it's a really cold, blustery day, you can always watch um, some of our webinars on YouTube. Um, we have one coming up about chronic wasting disease in deer, and another one about golden eagles. So something to keep in mind, um, those will both be online. And um, our presenting sponsor for tonight is Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, that's why we've got this lovely little venue. <laughs> um, so Oren is our speaker this evening, and uh, he was raised on the ranch that he still operates, and the ranch is the same distance between Nancota, Pontex, and Valerie, uh, with summer pasture of all native grass located on Pinto Butte, and wintering grounds 10, about 10 miles, which is a mixture of native and tame grass. The ranch has always raised black Angus cattle as a cow-calf operation, and nowadays, Orrin spends all of his time on the ranch, but has good help from his four daughters and their husbands and the grandkids whenever he needs it. Um, and I want to recognize that in 2020, Orrin received... Um, oh! Yep. Hello! Come on in! Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Uh, I was just saying, so in 2020, Orrin received um, uh, the Native Prairie Stewardship Award for his uh, commitment to the Saskatchewan Stock Growers Association, to PCAP, to Rancher Stewardship Alliance Inc., and South of the Divide Conservation Action Program, as well as to agricultural education. So he's been very involved in agriculture and conservation for a long time. Yeah. Take it away, Warren. <laughs> Wherever you want to sit. As you said, uh, yeah, I was raised in the ranch, uh, in there uh, continuously for, you know, might be gone a week here and there, but I never really, after school, I haven't went anywhere else, and uh, I figured out that I'd probably, uh, Sat on that little chunk of lamb that I operate for longer continuously than anybody probably from the last ice age has. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, uh, I've got, you know, quite a few species at risk uh, all around home, too, so I'm not a with my involvement in all the boards and stuff, I learned from a whole bunch of people that sit on them boards where I got my education. And uh, so what I do is basically, there's a couple of cross fences in the summer pasture that are holding fields more or less. The rest is one big, one big, uh, field and uh, I'm kind of fortunate where I'm at because I have uh, topography in my favor, water holes scattered all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, quite a few water holes that were dams that were built in the 50s and uh, so that helps to, uh, to disperse the cows without me having to fix a bunch of fences and stuff, they'll, uh, you know, most of the species were, that are around here are, you know, they like a various heights of grass and stuff to, some to nest in, some to feed in, so by uh, letting the cattle rotate, they'll graze off a patch and go to another patch and what I, uh, one of my theories is the, uh, the patches, you know, don't have to be, you know, 
40 or 50 acres, you can have uh, an acre or less of a patch that's bared off, and then they'll have, you know, acre next to it that uh, they don't touch, and so that gives them hiding spots and feeding spots, and you know, a lot of the prairie flowers and that are are attracting bugs that everything eats, so, and then the bugs, uh, you know, need them, or them, them plants need a, you know, a little less cover to, to be able to grow through the sunshine and grow, so the patchiness and the grazing is probably one of the most important things that I try and do and keep up. and. Uh, if the cows start hanging around one water hole too much, I'll go and I'll chase them into a different area. But uh, once we get to a water hole, like I say, the topography is uh, a big benefit to me because mm -hmm. from where the creek runs out to the south end to the high point of the divide is uh, 500 feet in elevation and a couple of two and a half mile distance. So Cow don't like to climb hills any better than I do. <laughs> and so uh, that makes a big difference in managing for, you know, for everything that's out there. I guess uh, another thing I kind of think about is a lot of these species that are listed as of concern to the endangered, I think they're pretty well shy creatures. They don't want uh, a whole bunch of interaction with uh, people out there bugging them every day type thing. So mm -hmm. by, by having them program that you handle your animals, you know, not too frequently, probably uh, encourages them species to stick around. They'll, uh, you know, if you're not there bothering them, then you bother them too much, they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that I notice is, you know, we talk a lot about native prairie, and uh, I know I have sprigs, pippets on crested wheatgrass pastures, and one of the attributes for pippet is, you know, paramount of litter, which is leftover, leftover dry dead grass from previous years. And I've had people measure like a thousand pounds of, <coughs> excuse me, thousand pounds of litter on a crested wheat pasture. So, you know, that's just about at the top of the range they like, because if you get too much, it's too thick and uh, you don't get any litter if it's grazed right off. There's nothing there. So, I don't know, it bothers me sometimes that all the focus goes on to native pasture and trying to preserve it when there's a whole bunch, like, lots and lots of tame grass in these last few years is being uh, plowed under, put back to crop, that is displacing a lot of the species that actually use it. It might not be their first choice, but they're there and they they will, you know, they will utilize them acres too. Um, like I say, I've been there, I've been through the droughts and the mm -hmm. droughts and the fires and the mm -hmm. blizzards and everything else and I uh, not much you can do about any of them. We don't have very many floods. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of a, if we get a flood, we're happy, I think. <laughs> but uh, it droughts uh, will change uh, the grass. Uh, in the 80s, my grass went from, uh, you know, a needle and thread, like a spear grass and wheat grass kind of a sword to uh, pretty well blue grandma. Like blue grandma is just a 
start growing warm feeds and grass, but uh, you don't get much litter cover or anything because blue gram and the leaves are so small it doesn't even have enough energy to put a seed head in both sides of its stalk. <laughs> it's all on one side. So, uh, so droughts can, uh, can change the prairie and now I, you have to look pretty hard up there to find a blue gram plant. You know, it went from one, one extent down and back up. So prairie will will adapt and the species have to adapt at the same time and that's, uh, you know, maybe there some of them that don't adapt quite quick enough are, uh, are more in peril than, uh, you know, meadowlark sits on a bent post and sings after all day, it's, it's just happy with whatever's there, it's got used to everything, whereas some of the species are are more, uh, a little more fragile in, in their lifestyle. Um, the thing, like, I had a guy, it's been a few years ago now, but he was uh, doing his master's degree in bird and stuff, and he was up there for two days. He found 23 species of birds in two days. And uh, like he left off the magpies and the ducks and the, okay. you know, the ones that are just uh, all over the place. He didn't put them on the list. So, you know, there is a fair, I have a fair diversity of birds. And some of the water holes have the uh, northern leopard frogs in them. And at home too, like I know there's leopard frogs in my downs at home. And uh, so I guess I'm doing something, something uh, right. And so, uh, if you can get that many different species out there. So anyway, uh, what else should I? I didn't make any notes. <laughs> I, have, I have some questions already. Yeah, if I yeah. can ask. Okay, I'm sure it'll flow with the questions, yeah. but. Um, Okay, so first question is, um, have you changed the way grazing happens on your ranch over the years or um, across generations or have, has it always been grazed the way you graze now? It's pretty well always been grazed the way it is. The, the major change is starting 15, 16 years ago, I uh, got grave and left the cattle on that native pasture up on top all winter. And so then I'm, you know, there's always spots way back in the corner that they never get to, even if it's only half a mile from water, there, there's a hill in the road or something. So it builds up a lot of litter. And I've had two prairie fires up there over my lifetime. And that's where the fires start, the lightning mm -hmm. okay. lights that litter on fire and uh, they run for a few miles and you get a couple hundred people show up from a <laughs> barren spot <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. But it, I figure it helped me, you know, for preventing the fires and stuff by winter grazing. And it's a like I'm up 3,300 feet in elevation and it wouldn't work this year because I can't even see my fences on the way down here. But, uh, so that's, that's one of the changes. Uh, the other thing is when I don't leave mine, I've only done it a half a dozen times where I've left them there through the winter. But uh, they move north to the home place and uh, so I stockpile a lot of grass now, like we used to <coughs> feed, uh, you know, like everybody else, who spent all summer putting up hay bales and spent all winter tossing out hay bales. And <laughs> so now I'm, uh, I've changed that, stockpile a lot more grass and uh, 
cows are grazing, they get some protein, even when they're up in the wide, they got protein tubs and so protein supplement. Mm -hmm. And this winter my cows are just still grazing. Okay. I I didn't get pallets to lock the New Year because the roads were highly icy, but uh, so they got a few grain bales earlier, but they haven't got a bale in 23. They're, they're getting pallets every other day and uh, they, uh, they've got to dig through the snow a little bit and work for their raw beach. So okay. that's, them are the two major, you know, a little bit of winter grazing on the native grass up there and uh, stockpiling a lot of grass. A lot of it is crested wheat mixed in with native hillsides and stuff, but yeah, I'm, they're still out there grazing. Have you noticed um, improvement in the condition by having them graze over the winter instead of just eating them? Yeah, and I don't know if it's. Uh, because I was grazing in the winter time, but uh, I've had uh, I, I've had uh, the grass uh, biologists and stuff that have commented that I have uh, the past was better than the first time I came down. Okay. So they uh, when you're there all the time. hard to see a change. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, one day to the next to the next, it changes are so subtle mm -hmm. that it's hard for me to tell. But somebody that only shows up every, you know, three or four or five years mm -hmm. on a tour, they uh, they can pick it up. They they know so. Yeah. Okay. And uh, okay, my other question is you mentioned that um, it's a shame there's not more focus on team grass because people are turning into farmland, probably for because you're able to get more profit, right? Um, but there's there's starting to be more funding available for native grass. If that same funding was available for non-native pasture, do you think less people would be choosing to farm that land? I think uh, to some extent. I think uh, you know, a program that covered both acres would uh, would maybe encourage you know a little more uh, a little more of it staying in yes. <laughs> as pasture and yeah. stuff uh, you know or even most most of it is the tame grass was originally seeded as a hay field. And and because it had uh, some really bad attributes, whether it's alkali or rocks or stuff like that. But after a while, like you say, the economics, they forget about that. The grass has got rid of the alkali on them, and the rocks haven't been plowed up every year, so they forget there's rocks there, and they, <laughs> they go out there and start their headache all over again, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Yeah. Like my tame grass, father seeded it in the early 60s, mm -hmm. and it's been tame grass for 60 years or more. Oh, wow. So uh, it acts it acts like a native grass. Yeah. And the last, I seeded the last of the farm in 90 and 91 or 92, somewhere in there. And I seeded pure alfalfa, and then the gophers moved in, and Shoot the alfalfa off, and it came back pure crested wheat. There wasn't a crested wheat seed up put it on it, but okay. that's what took over. And, and yeah, a few years ago, we got quite a bit of rain in the summer, mm -hmm. and I got probably 50% alfalfa back. And I'm, you know, I'm grazing out in the summer, but the, the roots of the seeds that had been there are still there. And, and then the last couple of years when it quit raining, well, now it's crested wheat again. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, we just roll with it. It's, yeah. You know, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of the animals have to do that too. They just probably learned a lot quicker than I have. 
run all the time, but yeah, digging dugouts into a into the water table is not a good idea. If you're doing more harm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Huh. <clears throat> um, can you tell us about Sprague's pivots? Sprague's pivots. Yeah. Uh, you told me once that you have them, or you've got the right habitat for them. Yeah. I guess I couldn't let you show, keep your picture up for that. that <laughs> I got a picture of a Sprague's pivot. Uh, I'm not going to say they need quite a bit of air. They're, uh, you, like, Gary, when I took that picture, and I've had uh, biologists and stuff that have studied them for the whole career and never seen one. In person, and uh, here for a couple of the future, <laughs> and uh, they, uh, you can hear them. They have a, I don't know how to describe it because I can't really hear them. I must tone down, and that's why I can't sing and play music. But I can hear them if I play it on a computer, but out in the, the open, there'll be people pointing there's a bit that they're a bit that they hear them. They, circle way high in the air and then uh, dive down a bit. I've seen them do that, circling and then they just nose dive right down the ground, scoot on, drop them throw that high off the ground and land in the grass, you couldn't find it. And it just, uh, so they're a uh, they, Litter is very important to them. They uh, make their nests and uh, well, they've yeah. got great big eyes and they have to go that high. <laughs> yeah. But their numbers are declining, like right across the statue. So you're doing something right if you have them. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of it comes down to that. I'm not there being water and uh, patch grazing. And like I've had people tell me they hear the people on the chain grounds. And uh, there too, like I say, I have a crest of wheat with a thousand pounds of litter and that's what would they like. And as stocking on our grass in the winter, I don't have to be out there. Around in the summertime, it's a tractor or whatever. So, and I, you know, my theory is a lot of the species are just shot. And uh, the less you disturb them, they, they get used to me. Like the one I took the picture of, I don't know how many pictures I took. And I was in my pickup. And I drive a lot, and it wasn't. That one wasn't, you know what we call optimal habitat. It was kind of on a little just at the bottom of the slope of a hill and there's a bunch of like bare ground uh, where there's no soil and just kind of dead rock and stuff and there's a whole bunch of not sagebrush but other weeds and stuff and when I seen it and dug my camera out and figured out how to turn it on it just kept, I never stopped the truck, I just kept kind of slowly idling along. And I'd take a picture, and I just kept getting closer and closer, and down there and look around, and uh, it, it let me get, uh, you know, from here across the street, away from it in the truck. I never tried to get out and do anything, and I never changed, and just left the truck, hopefully it would be a little walk or something. I just idled along, and I just started taking pictures. Should have been, mm -hmm. and yet 
you know, a few hundred yards away, there's, you know, good grass and stuff. It just happened to be there. It's kind of a, a wasteland type of soil and topography. And, and uh, the bad dugout that I dug was maybe a quarter mile down, down the slope. But, you know, we usually look up and, you know, more level top land where there's a lot of grass and stuff is where you expect them to be. And so it was kind of neat anyway to be able to <laughs> drive up on it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you had some ground squirrels in your alfalfa field at some point. Do you ever see burrowing owls using ground squirrel holes in your pastures? Yeah. I, <clears throat> it's been a few years, but uh, well, on that alpha that I would go to destroy, mm -hmm. I literally swathed over a badger bowl and uh, turned around, come back the next round, and there's burrowing owl come up out of the badger bowl. And like, help, help. And there's, there's another thing that, you know, they say burrowing owl is like pretty bare stuff. Yeah. And it's in. 12 to 16 inch high up Delpa. Yeah. And swapped over, swapped back beside it. It had young. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I don't know, I waited. The next day it was Saturday or something, so I took kids down and we sat back a little ways. And before I had a good camera, so we didn't get pictures of it, but the little ones were up and sitting there. And, I made habit by swatting over dollars. I probably made better habitat for it. Yeah. But when I went back to bail it, it had moved, I don't know, into the side hill from crest of wheat. It had uh, got sick of me rolling around on top of it. So. between a few grasses and you know, a few flowers and that. But I've had people point out uh, that there's uh, milkweed plants and stuff that the butterflies uh, will rely on and yeah. stuff. So, you know, there's all that too. And that, it all intertwines in how you graze. And so as you, you know, as animal move around and, mm -hmm. I don't know, people say this and they give it so much rest, but uh, in this country, like we've only got two months, we don't have three months of growing season really, so, you know, if you use it too hard, you're done for the year, it's not gonna, and I've noticed the cattle will, uh, you know, they'll be over here, they'll graze paddocks, and different grasses are different, grow at different times. And then they'll move on. But then later in the season, when some of the other grasses, later grasses mature, they'll go back to the same spot. But there's lots of grass there. They haven't taken it all of the first clipping. They, you know, they moved and they kind of make their own patches. And so they'll go back and so, get the second one. Like how many cows? <clears throat> how many cows are you running per acre on those pastures? I run uh, probably 35 to 40 acres to a cow. Having a big problem with the gophers the last couple of years? Um, like 
not not as bad as I see some, you know, I travel back and forth yeah. mm -hmm. quite a bit and uh, there's places, like there's one spot, there's been a gopro all winter, this winter. Oh, yeah. I've seen them like December, January, mm -hmm. February, yesterday. <laughs> oh my God, like you didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, that gopro's been I don't know, the same one, he hopes so, because <laughs> it's in the same spot, but, but yeah, so far I haven't had that big a problem, and over the years, up in the divide and summer pasture, I'll have quite a few gophers around branding grouse, yeah. because they're the same, they don't want any, they're like an owl, they don't want the grouse, and the cover, and that's where, you know, when you weed or whatever, the grass gets yeah. grazed right down tabletop type, and uh, and a little bit like the odd spot around the water hole, but nothing, nothing really bad up there. Like when you get out into the middle, there's enough grass. Gophers don't like it, so yeah. you can. Uh, they're kind of easy to manage that way because they're concentrated in a couple spots, but, mm -hmm. but uh, and at home, <coughs> so far I'm lucky they haven't, uh, they haven't moved in like some places have. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so have you had like an, an influx of, of uh, wildlife coming in on the grass too? Well, yeah. I don't mind the wildlife, like the deer and stuff, on the grass, but this is the first year that I can remember where deer have actually uh, moved into my stack yard. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I'd leave grass, like I say, the cows are grazing, but this year the deer refused to graze there. They moved into the stack yard, so I'm feeding bale to deer, not to the cows. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and mm -hmm. they're, they're feeding themselves my bales. Yeah. But usually, in where my yard is, you know, going east towards Nancota, there's open land, nobody lives. Like, I don't think there's anybody from my yard uh, six miles east. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's sections and sections and sections of not only farm land, but grass, but we're, you know, three to four years of drought and people are using that grass a little harder yeah. and everybody straight combines and they used to swap you have leftover grain and combine mist and stuff and now the straight combine and GPS you can go to sleep and not miss anything. So, you know, there's got to be less less forage out in that country for the deer and then We've had quite a few thaws this spring, mm -hmm. in January, so we've got a layer of ice uh, yeah. built up that probably hinders them, mm -hmm. you know, the deer from grazing too. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they were not only my stock here, the neighbors. Are, yeah. but, do, you, do you see them grazing very much on ground cedar and stuff, like out in the, in the prairie? Uh, yeah, the deer are more browsers. And, yeah. You know, they'll come out of the wool quills and that's yeah. where you'll spook them out. Uh, I've got, you know, Tokeshire, Saskatoon, and a bunch of bushes, one poplar coolie in there. And yeah. they, uh, they'll give it away at the, at the uh, you know, bushes and stuff. Snowberry a little bit. But yeah, years ago, I know, they used to uh, smoke their meat and stuff using the brown cedars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like your bare hillsides, creeping juniper and yeah. stuff mm -hmm. that they, uh, they would browse on. Yeah. And the lechon. There's lechon in the prairie grass too. Yeah. That they like to eat. Like that creeping juniper the last fire that went through, I had a trail up a hill out of the gap going west, 
and I just you know, always thought that the ground was level. Hmm. After the fire went through, Creepy Juniper was probably two feet deep <laughs> in that trail that it burnt it all the way, smoldered it all the way. My trail had a hump in it. I've been driving over two feet of juniper. Hmm. Um, all these fears and never Oh, never dawned on me that there's a hole there. Yeah, oh, so really? it, I never it grows, that. <laughs> yeah, it grows uh, fairly thick and heavy. That's <laughs> neat. Yeah. Hmm. Have you ever used prescriber? No. Or you don't need to get a pedal on that? No. And, uh, I bought too many buyers to start with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. A few years ago, uh, walked out of my house at home and uh, in the yard had dinner and walked out and all I could see was a wall of flame coming at me oh and uh, mm. the neighbors had been rolling the lentils or peas or whatever they had seeded when they turned they hit a rock and a rock pile sparks uh, started it and uh, so it burnt you know, 30 or 40 acres and a whole bunch of people showed up and the colony was there right away, and so they, uh, they burnt down to the creek. And, but it takes it takes quite a while, and that was all native grass there on that hillside. Mm -hmm. It it still hasn't. Uh, it's not back to what it used to be okay. from that fire. Mm -hmm. The two fires up in the divide mm -hmm. both started like. Uh, 24th and or 23rd and around the 30th of August from lightning strikes. Okay. And you know, early, you know, middle fall, I guess, and everything dried out. Mm -hmm. And so this one that burned at home was June. And uh and up on the Y T they graded a fire guard after the fire and so you can go from one side to the other, and that part was in 2001, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And uh, you can still, if you look close enough, you can tell the difference. Like it hasn't, it still hasn't come back to to what stuff that didn't burn is. Yeah. Like it, mm -hmm. and it's not uh, not that it's overgrazed or. They're hanging there. It's just the fire. It's taken away species and mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of fire. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. 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 Anyway, mm -hmm. I think I made a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. <laughs> Look at all my notes. I've got a whole page of notes here. <laughs> Just soaking up all your wisdom. <laughs> I have another question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I always have questions about grazing because I don't know a lot about it. So, <laughs> um, so you mentioned you have your big pasture that the cattle can just move between water holes and, and go where they want. And then you have smaller pastures. How do you organize that? Do you leave them in the big pasture for a long period of time, or do you take them in and out of the big pasture to put them in the smaller ones? No, the uh, small pastures that I call are one's about a quarter section, and the other one's about a section, and they're basically holding pins. So if I can get help or I need to get them in branding or weaning, I can put them in there the day before, have them close so and get an earlier start. Oh. Because uh, the big pasture, I didn't realize this until I got a quad, bought a quad to put the protein tubs out when I left them up there for the winter because I figured if I got my truck stuck and had to walk out, then I'm walking a long ways to find help. And, uh, then try to get somebody to come and get my truck back. If I had a quad and I got it stuck, I could walk to my truck and leave it there until spring. <laughs> and, uh, so I, 
I started uh, putting tubs out in different corners and I started following kind of the route we gather with horses and stuff. And I followed the route that a horse would take to get the cows into the corral. And you send horses out north, south, west. And uh, pretty well every one of them routes come back to me. 15 miles on a horse and you know, we're only gathering for two or three hours to get them in. And uh, so, it, you know, the three hours you save by having them small pastures. And, you know, you're not out in a big field. And usually if you stick them in one of the smaller pastures, the other ones uh, that you didn't find or were hiding from you, They'll get lonely and stand at the fence and wait for you to come <laughs> back with their friends anyway. So, yeah, that's you know, good plan. Every animal is kind of a, you know, a herd animal, so yeah. sometimes it works, sometimes uh, some of them old cows just decide they don't want to be anywhere near me and they just hide. <laughs> they generally <laughs> stay up there. Uh, yeah, like it's, they're just, you know, so they'll get used. One or, like the quarter section one usually get used maybe two days out of the year. Okay. But it's, you know, it's pretty heavily stocked too. Yeah. You know, all the animals are in there for them two days, so you don't want too much more. Mm -hmm. And then the other section one, you know, if I have to, I can leave them in there for a week, two weeks, and a whole herd. And, but it's the same thing, it's, it's only about limited time out of the whole year, the rest of the time they, they wander around the big field. Okay. So. Uh, have you taken out internal fencing in the large pasture, or it's always done that way? Um, there was cross fences. And the first one I remember was in 1967, and it burned out a lot of them internal fences. So my father just rolled the wire up, and uh, that's when it got turned into a, into one big pasture, basically. And he said that when the fences were there, that uh, cows would walk a fence line. So, you know, I can still see the cow trails on both sides of where the posts used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, the cows were just continuously mm -hmm. trying to get to the next field or whatever, move, but yeah, they all, once we uh, got rid of them fences, we used to, you know, move poles around the horse back, and so we are you know, all summer, once a week or something, we are moving, at least the bulls and the cows would wander into different spots from us herding them around, but yeah. now I don't know. I don't know where he got time to do it because I can't find the time, but uh, <laughs> they can to uh, disperse and they don't hang in one big herd, they hang in little family groups or whatever you want to call it. They're, yeah. They get their own little cliques and they just all their friends. And <clears throat> the water, uh, it's interesting because you'll have 20 cows and calves sitting there and one or two o'clock in the afternoon, 19 cows will leave the walk to the water hole. Okay. One cow will stay babysitting. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones, and they, they're not in a rush. They'll graze all the way back, take their time, they're away from their babies, and enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. They graze all the way back, and then, you know, it could be supper time before the babysitter cow gets to go have a drink. Okay. But, yeah, like they, you know, that quite a bit. Okay. And little herds, and yeah. they'll just leave one cow with a all of the cows, and cows frolic around and do what cows do, and she just stands there and grazes and lays down, and she's the guard for that day. And okay. So that you know, little things like that is kind of neat. They yeah. they have their they have their own social life figured out 
Yeah, yeah, that's really neat. Huh. So do you have much problems with like coyotes or wolves or cougars out there? Coyotes, uh, I can't say it. Uh, I think what the coyotes get is they just, you know, they deserve to have because they're probably sick or crippled or not going to make it anyway. And uh, cougars, I was, I don't know. I wasn't quite ten. I I know that, and I rode up on a cougar eating a cow one time, and so that would have been middle sixties sometime. And uh, I went back, told father and hired man when I got back to the corral, and nobody believed me. That there were no cougars. It could have been a bobcat, you know. Well, what did it look like? And well, it was about this high and tail about this long. And they didn't believe me, and I argued with my father for a week. And there, no way, there are no cougars. And I was still going to a little country school. Father finally went and asked the school teacher if we'd been learning about cougars in a class. And the school teacher told him, We don't even have a book with a picture of a cougar in the school. So then he started to believe me, so we went, rode back out there, and the cougar hadn't come back to the cow, but, so I don't know, same thing, I don't know if they killed the cow, or if the cow got, you know, just lay down and died. I know, a few it, years ago, we had one that killed a calf from a cow, and then the next couple days later, they killed the cow and left the calf. And so we made it the two. But after we finally got the, the cow to accept that second calf, when she when we opened the pen to let her out two weeks later with the calf, she left the calf up in the corral and went down where her calf got killed and she just plowed the dirt, just oh plowing it up over her back and bellering and and then when she was all down then she came back and got her calf and went out with the herd. Yeah. Mm, wow. But yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, it'd be what? About 12 years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, that's also the same year that the Davidsons lost a four year old bull to mm -hmm. the Cooters. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're fleas. Mm -hmm. um, so the Cadillac. Okay. North Lady Grants. Too close for Cougars, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. No, you walk. At that time. Like it was very rare, rare. Like, hey? I, at that time it was pretty rare to have yeah, right there. I haven't, I know where the Bates, and he'd been there, but he grew up not too far from the ranch. He rode all the country, worked on ranches, like in the park now and stuff as a kid. And he, uh, yeah, he wouldn't believe there was cougars there. And yeah. Since then there have been, you know, we've seen a few on and off, so. And they're another fairly shy animal, mm -hmm. so uh, you know you'll see the the kills and the tracks, and you'll see tracks with you know, paw prints in the mud around the water hole or something. You'll never see the actual cougar. Mm -hmm. So we did, we did get one opportunity to see a cougar. This would have been about probably ten years ago, at the up on the divide, mm -hmm. and. It was, I have a herd of about 20 horses, and what we noticed from, when we noticed what was going on, where the horses were running with their ears flat against their neck and they were trying to paw at whatever it was, and the mares and colts were all in, in a round circle with the colts inside, and the geldings were just taking that thing and gone, and it was like a streak of yellow. <laughs> That's about all you saw. <laughs> it was so fast. Yeah. yeah. But we lost a colt to a cougar just a, two weeks ago. Really? A week and a half ago. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, we thought it was coyotes at first. Yeah. And then we were talking to uh, Leo LaSalle, mm -hmm. and he said, well, there's been a cougar around Cadillac area. And um, 
he said, why don't you check your trees? Because we couldn't find the carcass. You know, when the, the coyotes usually eat, they'll leave things. Mm -hmm. And they'll leave a spot, right? We couldn't find it, hide your hair with the colt the next day. And so then he says, go check your trees. And we went and checked the trees, and sure enough, the colt is up in the tree. Oh, my God. It was storing its food. Those two weeks, too. Wow. Yeah. Do you, is it more frequent over the past years? My or? sister lost a mare uh, last year to Cooper. Okay. Yes. So it's more frequent. In Quantic's area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it must be coming from Cypress area. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to ride up to the Cougar Caves at Cypress all the time. Okay. Yeah. Huh. I think uh, they're probably more uh, more common than we think. Yeah. Because you just don't see them. You don't see them. Yeah. yeah. So. Thank <laughs> you. 